Hello and welcome to episode 5 of the Nostalgia Bubble podcast, the show where two lifelong best friends celebrate the movies that they love. I'm one of your hosts, Shuggy, an amateur film reviewer and nerd. I am Nye, uh, an amateur film reviewer's assistant and <laughs> also nerd. Yeah, and uh, it's my pick today. And I decided to go back to my roots, what I studied at university, and dive into classics. Uh, not not classics in terms of classic movies, although I'd call this one, uh, but as in ancient history. Yeah. Um, and it was? Jason and the Argonauts. Yes. I. When you said this, I mean, I, I'm Greek. I'm half Greek Cypriot, for any of you who don't know. Um, so it was quite nice revisiting. I'd seen this film before, but just kind of um, being reminded of ancient Greek mythology uh, yeah. was quite was quite fun. Um, so yeah, I'd seen this before. I was pleasantly surprised, I've got to say, because my memory of it was pretty vague. But um, I think I'd I'd kind of just pinned it as one I wasn't I didn't really enjoy, but I did actually enjoy it. That's good to around. hear. Good to hear. Yeah. So you, you talk about the ancient Greek mythology, and one of the things I found when uh, looking this up is one of the credited writers on this is actually Apollonius Rhodius, the guy from the 3rd century BCE who wrote the Arg... I'm going to mess this up so bad. The <laughs> Argonautica. Okay. Uh, I am horrible at pronouncing all these ancient Greek terms. Either, you know, only have to write them when you do ancient <laughs> history at university. You don't have to say them. So he's officially credited as a uh, yeah yeah it's co-writer. It's adapted from it. Like if you look on um, if you look on Wikipedia as I am right now, it says written by Apollonius Rhodios. Brilliant. <laughs> the so that's like one of the major things. Um, obviously, the actual ancient te- epic that it's based on. There are a lot more stories than what we get in this in terms of on the journey. Yeah. And it has part of the journey back as well, which has more stories. But this very much just focuses on three kind of interactions along the way and then getting to um, Colchis, where they find the fleece. So this cuts a lot of what is in the ancient epic. But the other major, major person involved in this film, I think, is Ray Harryhausen. Now, right. If you look at the film, we call it a Ray Harryhausen film. I'm fairly sure I did at the end of the last episode. Ray Harryhausen is not the director, he's not the producer, he's not the writer. Ray Harryhausen is the man who did the special effects. Right, okay. It, yeah, it is famed for its stop motion. Yeah, I can't think any film nowadays would ever be you know, mainly known for its special effects, like head special effects guy or girl. Uh, but the films he works on, you know, we refer to them as Ray Harryhausen films. I don't know the director, Don Chafee. I know this is a Ray Harryhausen film. Right. Yeah, I mean, it definitely... I, I think it's very much um, built its identity as a film around um, the special effects and um, around those kind of action sequences um, so, I mean, um, I think the, for me, the, it's the first time you see the special effects is that that's with the statue, right? Talos, yeah. Uh, Talos, yeah. Um, and I mean, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, uh, before, before kind of that direct interaction with Talos, there's a, a lot of like perspective work and stuff. I think, um, I really liked, so that moment where you see Hercules, by the Talos statue, um, yeah. and they look tiny, um, yeah, yeah. and it's it's clearly just kind of perspective work, but it's still a, an incredible shot. Um, yeah, I, I think actually the director Dodd Chafee deserves a bit more credit than just being known as a Ray Harryhausen film because I think he does well, or his director of photography at least. Yeah. Um, so the last thing I was going to say on Harryhausen is, you know, same with. This, like, you know, his films like Clash of Titans or The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, they're known as Ray Harryhausen films. And he is such an influential figure in Hollywood. The list of people who, like, hold him up as an inspiration to them is ridiculous. You know, so you've obviously got people like Spielberg, George Lucas and J.J. Abrahams. But also people like uh, 
Nick Park, the guy behind Wallace and Gromit. You've got people like Henry Selick, who did Nightmare Before Christmas. It's everyone who's anyone in Hollywood, pretty much, like reveres Ray Harryhausen. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's about the kind of innovation, isn't it? So even though we watch it now and clearly the special effects and, and the stop motion is dated, um, just understanding that at the time that it was made, um, it was kind of pretty pretty revolutionary. And, um, yeah, like the... And it's still, I mean, like I said, the, the kind of perspective work was still very much... Um, effective in the story so even watching it now in 2020 um i still i still kind of appreciated the innovation that went into creating those effects yeah i think you look at modern effects and they're all about looking as real as possible i don't think anyone's ever going to look at you know talos or the hydra and think oh these are real but i do look at them and think these are beautiful absolutely gobsmacking to watch I adore there's sort of four big monster sequences in the film and I adore every single one of them Uh, they just yeah they look so special and we talked in the Star Wars episode about practical effects versus digital effects and they don't compare for me yeah I mean I think that the uh, the there's it's quite entertaining to watch it back now for sure um, I really liked um, the moment with the uh, Hydra, the fight by the fleece, and mm. he gets picked up in the tail, and it's just so obvious that it's like it's stop motion, like he's not even real when you see him in in the tail of the, the Hydra, and I think um, I found I found it quite entertaining, um, but uh, yeah, I think it just adds a different layer as well. Um, it kind of it's almost like a crossover of genres whether that was intentional or not um, and that's something that you also don't really see as much today is that kind of um, willingness to sort of be flexible with incorporating certain types of animation into sort of into um, kind of action picture like live motion um, yeah and so, in a way, it's sort of quite refreshing as well. I agree, 100% agree. Okay, shall we get into the film properly? Yes. I mean, I actually, before we actually start talking about the film, I wanted to talk about the opening credits and Bernard Herrmann's score. Mm-hmm. Yeah, beautiful. I love the score to this film. This is a proper old-school epic. Yeah, absolutely. And what really interests me is it's Bernard Herrmann, who's probably best known for working with Alfred Hitchcock. So, like, you all know the Psycho score. Yeah. It's the same guy. <laughs> like, you wouldn't picture the two together, would you? No, but I guess that's just testament to his versatility, isn't it? Yeah, um, 100%. Which, I, I mean, that's that's what you kind of want from a, from a composer, is to be able yeah. to... I mean, even within a film, um, especially a film that has a kind of quite clear narrative and storyline with um and and because it's got those kind of i mean you were talking you briefly mentioned the sort of three interaction points across the film um and if you want to be able to really identify them as three separate um points in the story like plot points then you almost want them to have their own identity separate from each other and if the if the music can facilitate that, if you've got a composer that can facilitate that with their their sort of capabilities um, with with music, then even even better, really. Yeah, and I think his score throughout this entire thing is absolutely fantastic, and he captures, you know, the the decision not to play any kind of musical score over like the clashing rocks. And instead, just withhold that, and all we hear is the drum beat. Like that's a that's a deliberate choice from the composer, and the ability to kind of see that that's a moment that comes definitely from working with Hitchcock. That's how you build tension. Quietness helps build tension, and he nails it at that point. Yeah, I think a, a composer needs to be smart as well. They need to know when music is actually going to feed the story and the film, and when the kind of 
the lack of it is is going to do the same have the same effect and i think that yeah that most that moment in particular um i think is kind of is particularly poignant in terms of not having music there um i think the use of the drums kind of really sort of echo the the, the kind of clashing of the waves and mm. um without getting too kind of literally analytical about what's going on um i think that yeah that was just a very smart decision yeah i, I you can see the guy's just a genius composer as i say the the score to psycho is one of the iconic film scores of all time yeah that's kind of another one of those films where you don't even have to know the film to know that or to have seen the film to know that the music comes from Psycho. Yeah. It's a bit like the Jaws theme tune. Yeah, we spoke about. definitely. Yeah. Right. So we don't actually get introduced to Jason for a little bit. Instead, we go back to when he's a baby and this character, Polias, attacking Thessaly, where Jason is the son of a king. There's a lot of like very classic mythological stuff here with you know talking to soothsayers who give them this cryptic warning about future people coming to kill them. Yeah, this I is... mean, I I definitely think you'll know more about the specifics of the Greek mythology than I will, even though I'm the Greek one. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it, this is all basically a setup, isn't it, for for the narrative. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the narrative of Jason and the Argonauts particularly well. It's never one I've studied, but this kind of thing of a, a new king being warned of someone coming to take his throne at some point, and it will happen. Yeah, it feels and then very the, typical. Yeah, and then the steps that they take ends up ensuring that it happens because they've heard this warning. Yeah. Um, I think that's lost a little bit here because Jason already has this kind of plan to seek the fleece. So that that um, he already has the plan. He tells Polias that he has the plan when he doesn't know it's Polias. But that kind of wouldn't be the case necessarily in maybe Greek mythology because it's very much a case of this person seals their own doom because they've heard a prophecy. And then the steps they take to try and avoid the prophecy ensures the prophecy comes true. I mean, if you look at something like the tale of Oedipus, very much the case. Yeah, I mean, it ultimately becomes a lot less self-inflicted when you realise that um, that's almost uh, that's almost Jason's intentions anyway. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess the the initial setup and the sort of the um, general structure that is kind of explained beforehand at the beginning of the film feels very typical of like ancient Greek mythology. Incredibly, incredibly. So the whole thing about the one sandaled man coming to take his throne is the case <laughs> in the like actual myth. Yeah. Uh, instead of losing his sandal, saving Pelias as it is in the film, I believe Hera disguises herself as an old woman and Jason has to ferry her across a river, and that's how he loses his sandal. Yeah. But either way, he loses a sandal in a in a river, and Polias instantly realises it's him. And instead of just having him killed, because that would be immoral, sends him off on a quest he don't th doesn't think he can achieve, in this case, to get the Golden Fleece. But so he gets some advice from the gods. So there's this whole thing about Hera allowed to help him five times in the film, because his yeah. sister called for help five times. And she goes and burns a couple of those before they even actually meet. She yeah. she's what of scares Polias into the river. I feel like she's a little little eager to help. Um and I guess ultimately in directing Jason and in directing um Polias, it's almost as though None of this happens because of Polaris's <laughs> actions at all. Oh no, no! It's all it's all gods doing nonsense. That's Greek mythology. <laughs> There's a classic um, breakdown of Greek mythology, and most of it is unfortunately Zeus was horny. <laughs> it's most of the problems caused. Um, I kind of found I found Zeus to be a little bit childish, actually. <laughs> That's probably accurate too. 
uh, Greek <laughs> mythology, to be fair. Uh, I think it's very different to kind of the Zeus and Hera relationship we see in most myths, where it's a lot more tumultuous. There's a lot more just those two trying to kill each other's champions in some way. Yeah. Normally because Zeus had an affair. <laughs> Whereas in this, it's very much that they're playing a game and are just trying to one-up each other in the game. Yeah, it seems... way up. There's clearly like a contest between them. Um, yeah, very much so. I, I think... I mean, we'll, I'm sure we'll get on to the acting. Um, very stylized. Let's um, talk about it now. Yeah, Why not? okay, okay. Um, so, the acting for me was... I mean, as I said, it seemed quite obviously stylized. Um, I wasn't a huge fan. Uh, Very fan. I think, I think that the... Yeah, I... I mean, I'm very much, like, a fan of more sort of realistic, more realism acting. Um, it's it's not nuanced or real in yeah, any way. Um, and it's very kind of big, like, look over there! Yeah, um, there, was, there was one point where the um, skeletons were kind of being resurrected from the floor, from the ground. Yeah. And um, I can't remember the character's name. Um, Aetes. Yeah, was okay. yeah, was kind of going, and another one, and another one, and pointing at them, and there's there's more, <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, that does happen. Yeah, and I just kind of, I just thought, well, I mean, that particularly stood out to me, but it was very typical of the the type of acting involved. Um, I mean, I don't think you can. I think it would be different now, um, especially with things like the special effects and stuff, the whole, I think if this film were to be remade in 2020, um, the aim of the the production team would be to make it look as realistic as possible. Um, well, we have kind of an example of that. So a later Ray Harryhausen film, Clash of the Titans, mm. was remade, not not in 2020, but about 10 years ago maybe now, and it very much was pushing for more realism. The performances were more grounded, yeah. but it doesn't. It just didn't feel like it worked. Yeah. So I think, and and maybe that's also because it's it's a mythological story, or it involves mythological creatures or sort of narratives. And I think that it doesn't necessarily require that same level of realism um, that that a film would possibly aim for today. Um, if you had, I, I think it would look kind of odd if you had um, somebody sort of the, the kind of that sort of realistic acting, and then suddenly mm -hmm. you were faced with this stop motion Hydra or Harpy or whatever that that you kind of that just would have undermined that whole tone. So I understand that it's it's kind of all part of the package. Um, but yeah, I think for me, the acting was just not my style. Um, yeah, I I kind of agree with the acting, and but when you look at like the newer Clash and Wrath of the Titans, the they're like the only kind of real big sword and sandal films that have been made recently, mm. and they don't feel like they work. Even something you know like Troy, you know, which is now like fifteen years ago. What if I asked you about Gladiator? I think that's a very different kind of style of film. Yeah. It's going for historical drama action rather than this kind of adventure sword and right. sandal. Right. Okay. Film. Yeah. I think so. It doesn't have the big mythological stuff. It's, yeah. It is interesting that you mention that grounded. because when you look at something like Three Hundred, which although is still that sort of action drama, right. is also is it also kind of at, it also goes for this sort of mythological um, and sort of fantasy feel. And actually, if you look at the production of it, it's almost comic book like. So it's still that's because it was adapted from a comic yeah, book. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, they kind of kept that through the production of the film, and yeah. and I think that it works. That sort of, however subtle it was, that sort of almost non-realistic, cartoony um, sort of adaptation of it. Um, 
work. So even in those sort of more up to date productions, those more up to date films, maintaining that that kind of unrealistic or I don't really, I don't want to say unrealistic because I mean there there are plenty of things about it that are, but um, that sort of more more comic book like sort of fe- those four, yeah and those features i think just um somehow managed to convey that sort of genre even more effectively um so i i think yeah. that would maybe be like a more kind of up to date incarnation of what was attempted or what was created in jason and the argonauts um while still sort of maintaining uh that sort of less less realistic and in inverted commas um, aspect of it. But I also think even in something like 300, it's just going for like one battle, whereas this is going for several adventures where they encounter you know, m- monsters which isn't the case in 300. Like You have people who look slightly deformed, but yeah. it is essentially an army against another army. Even in a film like Troy, they took out sort of all the mythological elements of the Iliad, and instead kind of boiled it down to these are two armies fighting. Yeah. I would love to see more attempts to create kind of like films based on Greek mythology these days, because I think Thor almost is like the way to go, if you look at the Thor films. Yeah. Right, let's kind of get on with these, you know, he forms a crew, um, including Pelias's son, who's there to kind of sabotage things. Uh, mm-hmm. Acastus, and they get underway. Also, Her- uh, Hercules is there. I keep wanting to call him Heracles, <laughs> but because everyone only knows the Romanization, that's what we're stuck with. And the first kind of big obstacle they come to is the Isle of Bronze, yes. where they are told you can eat and drink as much as you want, but don't take anything else. Yes. And uh, Hercules immediately, as soon as they find some treasure takes a big gold brooch, you know, a god's brooch, because he thinks this is a good javelin. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think, I mean, this is, so obviously, by this point, Jason has now assembled his crew. Um, They are, the majority of them are athletes. Um, He's effectively held an Olympic Games in order to gather his crew. Um, and Hercules is part of that crew. Is I mean, you don't really see too much of his athleticism. You see the kind of discus throw, um, but other than that, it's more implied that he is kind of head and shoulders above everyone else. Um, yeah, he's he's known. Yeah, um, and then, but it's very much like up until the point where he stays on the island it's very much known that he is brawn and not much brains and actually i think that's that's said in the film Um, yeah uh hylas his who is in mythology his actual companion is uh wants to join yeah and challenges Hercules to a discus throwing contest, yeah. and he 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 matches Hercules through his use of his brain rather than Hercules is just brawn yeah. and strength. Yeah, and um, and you see that you kind of see Hercules as a bit of a uh, maybe a bit of like a frat boy. <laughs> Dumb jock yeah. is the exact phrase I had in my yeah. head. Um, he's he's sort of not very emotionally aware doesn't have much depth to him um and is but is obviously very physically capable um exceptionally yeah yeah. and then obviously you get to the point where they're about to sail on and he kind of says no i'm staying um and uh which is i mean that's that's when you kind of go okay we see compassion in him as well he's not just an idiot Hmm. But he doesn't realise, or like he he, there's there's an element of idiocy about that anyway, um, because yeah, because he's clearly Hylus not going to find Hylus, and he knows that Hylus is dead. So, um, he yeah he's a he's an interesting character. He doesn't he seems a little out of place with everyone else. 
I think. Mm. Um, everybody else seems a lot more focused as a character. Um, but I think, I think generally because of the role that he plays in the story, I don't think that's too much bad. I don't think that matters too much. Yeah, I wrote a whole dissertation on how Hercules is represented in uh, films. Then, so, then fire away, go for it. Let's see what you've got to say. I don't, I don't think I address this one much. Um, he's, I, you know, I focus very much on like the Disneyfication, you know, the the heroism kind of aspect rather than yeah. uh, specifics of the filmmaking. So I, I, yeah, I don't think I talked about this one, but. I, I 100% see where you're coming from with this. He he does come across as a dumb jock, but you get the sense that he forms this genuine friendship with Hylas. Yeah. And I think if it feel if he feels kind of out of place, it might be because he is a little in terms of the narrative, like the actual myth. Um, a similar thing happens rather than being crushed by Talos. Hylas is kidnapped by some nymphs. Right. So Hercules stays behind to look for him in the actual myth as well. Okay. So there is that kind of he feels separate from what's going on. He's just a name who steps in for a bit. Yeah. So almost like a cameo. Almost like a cameo. Yeah. You know when you see like Captain America pop up in a Hulk film yeah. or something. Yeah. Like that. We don't have any Hulk films, but you know <laughs> we have one, but it doesn't count. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, and now we have to talk about Talos. Yes, Talos. Um, I love Talos. It is my favourite movie monster moment in the film. Yeah. It was voted by Empire as the second best movie monster after King Kong. Right. Um, And I love every scene with him. Yeah, I think it's... I just... I think for this, I really appreciated the simplicity. Um, Yeah. It wasn't too kind of overdone. Um, I mean, I think they were obviously they were obviously restricted in the way that they could make it happen. Um, so mm. I don't think they could over. It would be hard to overproduce this part of the film, um, if that makes sense. But um, yeah, I think I like the nod to um, Achilles as well. With the heel. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's deliberately meant to be a nod to Achilles or it's just that's what actually happened. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, um, possibly. I mean, I read it as a nod to Achilles, but it may not be. Um, and, yeah, I just think... Um, I mean, this idea that um, this thing is roaming around on its own island, um, similar to Kong, I guess, um, is... Uh, is just yeah, and it sort of owns that place. I thought it was really cool. So I don't know if it's meant to be he owns the island. I think it's a protector if anyone steals the god's treasure. Is kind of how I read it in the film. Uh, and right. he doesn't he doesn't awake until someone tries to take the treasure. Yeah. You see, like as soon as Hercules, you know, picks up the treasure, there's almost a warning where he's shut in before they. Actually, unle- before Talos is unleashed, yeah, I mean, there's Hercules also a warning so from Jason. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a literal warning, but I think there's that extra level of warning where Hercules, you know, picks up the brooch and the door slams shut. Yeah, and it's only because of Hercules's ridiculous strength that they get out, and that's when Talos wakes up. And I do love that moment where they get out. Hercules is feeling great about it, and then there's a noise, and they're all kind of looking around, and it's that low angle up at Talos with them in the kind of the foreground and then Talos's head just moves. Yeah. Like it's epic. I, I that is seared into my mind as a kid, that just moment as it turns and it's like, oh my god. Yeah. Um no I did I did enjoy that whole scene. I think I it was my favourite um myth- mythological monster scene mm. in the film. Um I mean Obviously, as somebody who doesn't know sort of Greek mythology as well as you, I probably won't be able to give you as much insight. Um, but I found it entertaining. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know anything about Talos apart from this film. So 
I, I'm right. not an expert in any way. Uh, although it is, it is kind of a pretty lame ending that you just unscrew something and it's healed. And all the kind of yeah. liquid pours out of him. Yeah. Um, I, I, but I love the whole fight scene. As long as you're not paying too much attention to where he puts his feet, it looks great. Uh, the kind of angle from the ship looking up at him, that's another one where it looks fantastic. Yeah. Um, the moments where he's kind of trying to step on the, the you know, the crewmen, that maybe not quite as strong, but it's a really cool fight. Yeah, I mean, I think anything that's perspective work was done very well. Yeah. Um, I think anything that was sort of interactive between the sort of monsters and, and the people were and the crew were always going to be hard. I mean, you yeah, see yeah. it at other points in the film. Um, you see, uh, I don't want to go into it too much yet, but obviously the skeleton fighting scene. And I think that's somebody gets... pretty good compared to the rest of uh, them. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think by this point, like, I was just... I was just looking closely that's and fair, it's like one, when somebody gets stabbed and like it's clearly like just being edited on top of another on top of another shot yeah and yeah so, like, I mean, well that's how they have the, to do it the sword the sword just kind of like fades out and it's um but I think those kind of interactions were always going to be limited mm. in terms of production but um all the perspective stuff was done brilliantly and I think for me, I just really appreciated the innovation of it all. Yeah. Um, I liked the the moment with when Talos picks up the ship. It's really cool. And I really liked the kind of cutting from the sort of wide shot where you see him holding this, what is quite clearly a model ship, um, and then kind of cross-cutting that with sort of actual actual shots of a ship, a real ship being destroyed. Yeah, yeah. Um, and kind of being encouraged to just piece it together, just watch it and kind of just accept it for what it is and that sort of... And again, like, that's that's about perspective and stuff. And I think when... Where they try to manipulate the audience perspective, I think that was done... That was just done brilliantly. I also think with Talos being the first one, you don't appreciate the way it moves as much. Because he moves very kind of staccato and very joltily. And you think that might just be the stop motion. But when you see all the other kind of stop motion characters, I think very much that's a deliberate choice because he is this kind of giant bronze man that he doesn't have a flexibility of movement. Because when you see the skeletons, they're moving very fluidly. But he... Yeah, thinking back after having seen the other characters... I was more impressed with Talos because it was yeah. a deliberate choice. I've got to say as well, the sound effects on Talos, I mean, you had the kind of creaking of the bronze. Stunning. Um, which were just done brilliantly. Yeah. Um, it wasn't... And I think that kind of... That detracted from the sort of any reservations that you'd have about the movement quality mm. because it complemented it so well that it was quite clear that it was meant to be that way and it was meant to give that effect. So it wasn't it, it wasn't anything about a lack of quality, um, which makes you which does just make you appreciate it for what it is and make you see that that was the intention. Yeah. Um, and I think when you look at like the next one, the harpies who look really cool flying around you get like oh they're making deliberate choices with each one of these about how they want them to move and with Talos he is this big kind of slow lumbering guy and that's their advantage given his size is that they're small and quick yeah so let's talk about these harpies so they use up all their clues or hints with Hera and uh, she directs them to find Phineas who is a blind prophet who misused his gift of prophecy, so has been tormented by harpies and blinded by Zeus. I found out he is played by Patrick Troughton, who oh, really? is the second Doctor from Doctor Who. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't recognise him watching the film. I have never recognised him watching the film, so that's very impressive. Nice. 
Yeah, I think these harpies are really cool. Uh, for me, this might be the weakest of all the set pieces, but it might just be the best of all the monster designs. The harpies look stunning like the sleek the way they fly around looks genuinely believable for me that they are an actual yeah. flying beast i think it's slightly undermined by the fact that they just end up in a wooden cage yeah as, as i said i don't think the set piece is the best uh they just catch them in a net and then prod <laughs> them with sticks for a bit and then drop the net on them it's it's not as you know epic as the Talos fight or as cool as the skeleton fight but I, I think well, as creature design they're very awesome in terms of design yes um, I do think they, they definitely pose the least um, amount of threat but it's possible because they're not there to engage with Jason mm. um, or the other sailors like they're there for um, in Phineas. order to kind of harass Phineas and um, I think so it's possibly I think in terms of like that scene that's possibly why there's a different tone to it because it's it's not so much that they're protecting themselves it's that they're going after something else um, yeah. and even though that's ultimately the same thing with the Hydra because obviously they're trying to get to the fleece um, it's uh, they they're not kind of attacked in the same way from the harpies yeah, and but the character's reward for saving Phineas from the Harpies is some advice about going through the clashing rocks. Yes. It's the one bit of the mythology that I do remember from a kid is the clashing rocks. Um, they change it up very much in this. Uh, they're given a amulet to the god Triton. Yeah. Which he, uh, which Jason then uses to summon Triton to hold back the rocks when they get there. I remember in the mythology, they release a bird or something through the rocks. Yeah. And then, as it kind of opens, they speed through with some yes. help from Hera. I mean, ultimately, it is like Hera's move, isn't it? There's a point where they're playing, it's almost like chess. And they've got like pieces, and she's yeah. the one that places Triton there. Um, so, I guess in a way, she's still... She's still helping. And that's that's also kind of like going back to how it's just like a game between the two of them. Um, yeah. Yeah, I really like this scene. I, I I think this is a big improvement on the mythology. Yeah. Visually, visually to watch. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed watching this scene. Um, seeing Triton kind of come up through the water... Um, just the crown sort of emerging first. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. And uh, what I like about this is, it's obviously it's more more perspective work, so it's not kind of yeah. somebody edited edited into the water or whatever. It's actually uh, somebody emer like coming out of emerging from the water, um, and they've used perspective in order to um, in order to kind of um, create the effect. And, I mean, it's really interesting because you can tell that it's not seawater. You can tell that it's not such a huge, um, a huge god coming from the water. Like, you, you know that um, because of the way that the water's bubbling and stuff, you can tell that it's all perspective work. Um, but, it's, it, again, it's just, like, testament to how effective it can be um, while still being quite obviously um, a trick of the eye. Yeah. And I, I've i always just loved the, the shot of him with his arm across the the uh, little pass. Yeah, I think, for me, this was my favourite scene of the whole film. Interesting. Yeah. So after they make it through the rocks with Triton's help, there was another ship that got crushed, which is a very cool sequence, actually, where we see the the rocks crush the ship and it's kind of all done through falling boulders and yeah. we find a survivor and this is I'd say the listed as the second main character, the leading actress Okay. I found a stat, this is 66 minutes into a 99 minute film right, so 
she was in it for a third she was in the for the last third of the film and she's the main she character. was listed as the second second, the second lead yeah okay and this is Medea now I do know a bit about the character of Medea because I've studied yeah. the tragedies that kind of follow the whole Jason and the Argonaut story she is a very different character in this film than she is in the mythology even in the Jason and the Argonauts mythology. So she helps them escape by murdering her own brother. Okay. Uh, She's just a sort of a lot darker, almost a more sinister character. And when they get back to Thessaly, I don't know if it's Thessaly in the mythology or not, uh, but Jason becomes king. And stuff kind of all goes wrong, but he has a couple of kids with Medea. He goes and marries... Uh, the young daughter of another king. Basically, a younger, richer model, if you will. Right. And okay. uh, Medea doesn't take that very well. And there is a whole tragedy about this where Medea is the main character and essentially tortures Jason by murdering their children and his, I believe, his new wife and then flying away in a chariot. Okay. Um,. Yeah, that wasn't in the film. Nothing even close to resembling <laughs> a character like that's in the film. And she's a lot quieter. Definitely has a sort of mystical presence yeah. to her, but not this kind of sinister mysticism. I think that kind of fits with the tone of the whole film. Um, also with Hollywood um, as it was, and probably as it is now, um, the depiction of one of the only female characters mm. besides Hera really um, who inevitably becomes a love interest I mean I know obviously that's part of the mythology but um, depicting her as this kind of in inverted commas womanly woman um, I think feels very typical of Hollywood yeah you know? Although that, that moment where she kind of saves him from the jail cell, he's like, it must be a trick. She's like, no, I'm coming with you because I love you. It does feel completely yeah. unearned in a film, but yeah. also feels exceedingly typical of Greek mythology. Like The amount of people who are just in a forest and see someone and are suddenly in love is ridiculous. But when you get it into a narrative like this, it does feel very unearned for me. Yeah, I think especially when the sentiment it, it completely contrasts with the circumstances of the narrative. Mm. So the fact that she's helping them escape somewhere because their their lives are in danger and then suddenly it turns into a romantic drama. <laughs> um like there's that kind of real a, a real obvious contrast there which feels a little um I don't know what the word is to describe it. I guess a a little shallow, a mm. little thin on the ground, not very substantiated. Very much, yeah, very, very much. Although I will say it's kind of implied that you know, the only reason she's helping them is because she's suddenly fallen in love with Jason, having met him 20 yeah. minutes ago. <laughs> and of course the film ends with them kissing in a fade out. It's very Bond-esque, isn't it? To the end. Yeah, I did think that actually. I'm fairly yeah. sure there's at least two Bond films that end with them in something in the sea, making out. <laughs> yeah. But actually, before they and before they quite get to uh, Colchis, uh, Acastus finally reveals his treachery. Or actually, Jason kind of accuses him of of it. I don't know if he kind of realizes it's Pelias's son or not. I think it's kind of implied that he's worked it out because Hera semi revealed. That the guy she threw into the river was Pelias, but I'm not certain. Because there's kind of the dramatic moment where Aertes announces that he's the son of Pelias. Yeah. Or no, uh, the yeah Aertes announces that Acastus is the son of Pelias. Yeah. Um, and I think well, that's that's when Jason kind of obviously knows. He does seem pretty shocked though. So. Mm. Maybe he so I don't know if that's that point. if that is the case. I don't know why he suddenly accuses Acastus of wanting to attack by night so he could stab Jason in the back. Yeah, if he doesn't know, it feels like a weird moment. But anyway, they have a fight and Acastus escapes and betrays them to Aertes, who has them all locked up in jail. So 
once he has escaped, both Acastus and Jason go after the fleece. And when Jason gets there, we see this Hydra come out with Acastus in its tail, having killed him. Um, again, this is slightly different from the mythology. Obviously, the Hydra is something that Hercules fights in his Twelve Labours. Uh, the thing that guards the Golden Fleece is more like a big dragon. But we get Hydra, I think, because it's more well-known. It's a more familiar kind of name monster for Greek mythology. Oh, so you think they just assigned the name? No, no, I, I think they deliberately chose a Hydra because it is more famous. You know, the seven heads and all of that. Oh, okay, so you're saying in the mythology it's more like a, a big dragon. It is a big dragon, yeah. Piece. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, yeah, I think already there's been um, a lot of incorporation of Greek mythology throughout the film. It's all been interjected from different areas of Greek mythology. Um, so I think it's kind of in keeping with with the film. It's almost like um, kind of a crossover. I don't know. I think <laughs> yeah. I think sorts. this might be the kind of first like, major change to bring something else in from mythology because even someone like Hercules does appear in the myth for a little bit. Whereas this yeah. feels like we've got a dragon, people don't know dragons are Greek mythology, what's like the nearest most famous counterpart right. we can add? Yeah. Um, can we also just talk about the fleece for a second? Sure. So, for a start, I mean it seems to change colour. Yeah, it's lots uh, of, of very times. golden, then it's almost browny. It, yeah, and then it's golden again. Um, you, can f- you can literally see the tinsel. <laughs> 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 um... Uh, which I, I mean, I very much enjoyed. I thought that was quite funny because they obviously they do a couple of close-ups on it, um, and it looks like an over-decorated Christmas tree. <laughs> um, and yeah, there is one point where it does go a bit brownie, and you like you wonder if they've dropped it in the mud or something. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, you get to see its power. Heals, heals Medea after she's shot in the back with an arrow yeah. which um, is just carelessly pulled out by Jason <laughs> yeah that definitely did some more damage <laughs> yeah um, what I liked about the film was that obviously Jason's story was about trying to get the fleece and get back and um, prove himself um, but I really enjoyed that actually the majority of the film was a, was not about the fleece. Hmm. Um, it was kind of dropped in. We knew that that was where they were heading, um, but it was it was all about the kind of the interactions they had on the way, um, and even on the way back. I mean, even after getting the fleece, um, when they're sort of fighting the skeletons and stuff. It's less about the fact that they have the fleece, yeah. and it's more about the action. So again, this is sort of another big change from the mythology: is the kind of betrayal, and you know, him he fights the Hydra, and then they fight the skeleton warriors that Aertes summons. In the mythology, Jason very much just admits that he's there to steal the fleece, or he wants the fleece. Yeah. So how Aertes deals with this is he sets him some tasks that are impossible. The first one is fighting the dragon that guards it. Uh, Medea just puts it to sleep, <laughs> which would have been a l- lot less impressive uh, cinematically. Yeah. So once he's done that, he's the one who sews the dragon's teeth rather than just Aertes throwing them all over the ground. And then he has to fight the skeletons on his own which he does successfully. Um, yeah. Whereas in this, they're kind of very much portrayed as unkillable. You know, because Jason stabs a few, knocks the heads off, and they all come back at him. Yeah, or well, one of them gets stabbed through the ribs. Um, I'm surprised. He takes a head off. He takes a head off, yeah. I'm surprised that the one... I'm not surprised, sorry, that the one that got stabbed between the ribs didn't die. Because you're effectively there. just stabbing air. So Yeah, do not um, have a heart. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> he's fighting with two other um, sailors, uh, yeah. both of whom die. Um, so he does end up effectively fighting them on his own. Uh, yeah, this scene 
I mean, I've spoken about the the visual effects of the scene um, briefly, um, and it's I like the job they've done with the fact that they've layered, they've clearly layered two scenes on top mm. of each other. Um, I I think this is quite, this is kind of the most iconic part of the film, isn't it? Incredibly. Yeah, yeah. this is, I mean, when I picture Jason and the Argonauts, this is the scene that I picture. Even though it's not I think necessarily... think you mentioned. Yeah, I think when you... I think you mentioned this last time. Yeah. Um, it It didn't disappoint. I actually really enjoyed it. It's an amazing scene. I think you, you said there's a couple of points where it's very obvious that you know stuff's not happening, but I think they do a really great job of kind of matching up the, you know, skeletons parrying the, you know, a- actual people's sword strokes. Um, okay, a few of the actual bits of sword choreography, you know, where they're jumping over the sword, aren't yeah. great. Yeah. And the first, the first death where he's trying to climb up on something, so he puts his sword down to climb up, and then he's yeah. just immediately stabbed. <laughs> That's just he's asking to be stabbed at that point. Yeah. But I think for the most part, this works so well. As I say, I think the fluid movement of the skeletons is really good. Yeah. Like this is for me the pinnacle of Ray Harryhausen's work, and I think he probably said the same kind of stuff. Yeah, I I very much enjoyed this scene. Um, regardless of like visual effects and stuff, I just thought it was kind of a very entertaining scene. I mean, the backdrop is brilliant. Um, I like the I like the way it ends with him jumping off the cliff um, and sort of leading them mm-hmm. to. I think it feels very much like. Um, almost like the character that Jason's sort of been set up as um, all the way through the film, that kind of um, he, he's he's taken a whole bunch of people to the very edge of the world, I mean to the end of the world um, and taken them very close to death um, yeah. they're, they're all there for him um, mm-hmm. and I think it's all. It seemed to me. It's kind of struck me as a very sort of um, blunt metaphor. Um, <laughs> him just l- physically <clears throat> leading people off a cliff. Um, it's very fair. I yeah. mean, I think they do say at the start of the film when he's asked how he's gonna, you know, get the ship and the crew together without any gold, and he says, "Through the hearts of men" or something like that. Yeah, you know, the he very Greek much is, pride. He talks about the pride of. Yeah, the Greeks. he's very open about his skill is in getting people to follow him is in, in his, it's in his leadership. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was just quite appropriate. Um, but yeah, I thought that scene generally was, was a brilliant, brilliant action scene. Yeah. This is my favorite scene in the film. Like it's iconic for a reason. I think Talos might be my favorite monster, but this is a, just such a cool scene. Yeah. Uh, I think this I is say, up there for sure. Yeah. Beautiful choreography. Yeah, very well done. Um, I think, like, just kind of using the different levels. I mean, they obviously mm. challenged themselves on this production. Um, Incredibly. Yeah, yeah, like, it wasn't... Like, you were talking about kind of um, sort of lining up and sort of editing together that that action sequence. And I think... They could have made it a lot easier for themselves, but they really didn't. Um, and you can, and I think it paid off. I mean, just using, like when they're climbing up the walls and jumping over, jumping from one to, wall to the other and stuff. Like, yeah, it just adds a whole different level of um, anticipation to the scene. Um, and I think, yeah. There's a real. I had a real appreciation for the work that they put into it. Mm. Yeah, I mean the amount of work that must have gone into this. So, you obviously, you have to film the actors doing this scene without anyone there, and then you've got to go and individually shoot all the skeletons doing this stuff one movement at a time, and then you've got to match it on. And if anything doesn't look, yeah, if anything looks bad. You've got to go and shoot the skeletons doing it again. That's crazy. That's absolutely yeah. crazy. 
Um, it's actually wild the amount of time it must take. Yeah, I imagine they probably got part way through the process and went, oh, God, what have we got ourselves into? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And then that's kind of the film ends. So we don't get to see him go back to Thessaly and yeah. claim his throne. I found it interesting that there is, I think there is kind of a, a big change in Jason through the film. It starts off with him being this kind of driven person, doesn't believe in the gods. Um, he's obviously taken up to um, to Olympus, Olympus, and he's his mind is changed. Um, and I think gradually throughout the film, you see him become slightly less selfless and more compassionate. I mean, he starts off by saying, "Oh, well, I'm." I'm not gonna. I'm gonna appeal to these people through their, their sort of pride, their sense of pride, um, and then the first conflict they have um, with Talos, um, one of one of the crew dies. Somebody else. He leaves somebody else on the on the ship, um, and obviously he gets told that like Hercules, Zeus has his own plans for Hercules and stuff, and. Um, mm but he just leaves one of his crew members. The second stop, um, he helps someone, and obviously he gets something back, but he helps someone with his crew. And then I think when he f when they find the fleece, um, and uh, he obviously faces the Hydra, he kind of puts himself in harm's way. And then he ends up, I think, it, you you just ever so slightly just gradually see him just change a little, and then obviously at the end he's right. got he kissing he's kissing and <laughs> he's compassionate and he's a lot he's a lot less. But he also him and the two soldiers you know they stay to yeah, hold off ready to the sacrifice themselves. skeletons while Argus yeah. and Medea head which back I to think the ship. is a real contrast so. between him then and at the beginning because at the beginning it's all about trying to convince men to sacrifice themselves um hmm. and and then by the end of it it's him that's that's kind of doing that and he that's i th i find it that's kind of when you see his leadership you're right i think he does have an arc i think it's subtle but it is it yeah. is there there is a there yeah. is a change in him for sure so that's kind of comes to the end of the film if you want to know about what happens, do you want to know what happens with Jason and Polias in the mythology? Yeah, why not? Why not? Yeah. So because, well, actually, this is another change: is Polias, you know, encourages him to do this task, knowing that he probably won't achieve it. There's a lot of that in this uh, stories. So he comes back, and Polias goes, "Well, I guess you know you've claimed that. Well done. You can you could come live in our palace or something," and. It's actually Medea who kind of ends up getting Polias in her devious ways. Okay. So she goes to Polias' daughters and shows them this kind of trick where she kills a baby uh, ram and then she brings it back to life. And she's like, you can do this magic too. Go try on your dad. <laughs> okay. I mean, I believe... again, that is very typical of... Greek mythology, I think. Yeah. Um, that sort of sacrifice without thinking about it. Yeah. Oh, so um, actually, let me... I just got to correct something. So she kills an old ram, and it is resurrected into a young one by dismembering it and boiling it in a pot. And so she is trying to like convince them to do the same for their old dad. But he's just dead. Right. <laughs> Right, okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, so this film comes out, it's a big critical success, like, critics love it, it's gone on to become a cult classic. Uh, in At the 1992 Oscars, Ray Harryhausen was receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award, and Tom Hanks, yeah, he says that this is, in his opinion, the greatest film ever made. I don't know if I'd go that far, Mr. Hanks, but, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, you are a beloved figure, so I'm not going to... Not going to disagree too vehemently with you. <laughs> so have you got any kind of final thoughts on uh, Chasing the Argonauts? Revisiting um, it? I think I'd I just reiterate what I said at the beginning. Like I was just really pleasantly surprised. 
Um, I think uh, if my memory of it was very vague. I, I, uh, like I said, the, I had that kind of staple image of the fight with the skeletons on the top yeah. of the cliff um, in my head. But I and I, I remember, I remember them the moment they spot the sh- the the fleece. I had those two images in my head. Um, but yeah, I just kind of really enjoyed sort of going back to it. I appreciated um, the visual effects and, um, while the acting wasn't totally my style, um, I, yeah, I generally just kind of really, I just enjoyed it. I had a good time. It was a fun, easy watch. Yeah. I love this kind of whole style of sword and sandal adventure movies something I wish Hollywood would do more of, but I also can see it not working in kind of for modern day audiences. As you say, this whole style of acting, I think, works for the films, but maybe wouldn't necessarily work for a modern audience at all. And when you try and put in kind of more serious, you know, straight acting, it just feels a bit dull and dreary. Yeah. But I adore this film i saw it as a kid and i've seen it you know a bunch of times since i love these stop motion creatures i think all four that kind of appear are beautifully designed in their own way uh the simplicity of of um talos and the scale uh to kind of the weird creature design of the hydra and the harpies to just the elegance of the skeleton warriors uh they will always be you know, among my favourite movie monsters forever yeah. and this is you know, absolutely one of my favourite films it's one of the films that kind of definitively pushed me towards doing classics in my life so that was a you know, big part oh, of my life so yeah I, I adore this cool. one. and that means it's your pick for next week I believe it is my pick for next week um, so from one kids film to another I guess. Um, So this film I loved growing up. Um, There has been a reimagination of it since. Um, And um, yeah, so this one is uh, the original Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Ooh, okay. I, I don't yeah. know what you mean original. There's only ever been one. There definitely wasn't <laughs> ever a sequel, and we won't address this at all. Yeah, I'll tr- we'll try not to talk about that one. Um, so, uh, for those of you who are trying to remember which one's the original, um, Gene Wilder, um, and I'll leave it there. Yeah, I don't so, I don't think I've seen this one since Gene Wilder passed, so I'm excited to visit it yeah. again. Yeah, it, I just absolutely love this film. I have great memories of it, and um, there was no way that I could not try and watch it again um, awesome. for, for this at some point. So, yeah, I'm looking, looking forward, forward to, it. to that. Yeah, looking forward to mm-hmm. that. All right. Cool. So, we've been the Soldier Bubble Podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Podbean, YouTube. We're trying to get anywhere else you want us to get on, we'll try and do it. Uh, you can follow us on social media at Nostalgia Bubble on Twitter and at Nostalgia Bubble Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. You can follow me at Shuggy Says, that's S H U G G I E Says on all social media platforms. And Night? You can find me on Twitter at Nye Reese, so N Y E R E E S, and you can find me on Instagram at Reese Nye, so R E E S N Y E. Fantastic, and we'll see you next time. See you soon. Bye bye.